Welcome to the Bioptimizer's awesome health podcast. And now here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. Want awesome health? How about doubling your energy? With our free awesome health course, you can get a new video and lesson every single day for 84 straight days. The course covers everything from optimizing your digestion, nutrient intake, correct health issues, including weight, skin, energy, immune system, and so much more. The course could easily be worth two or $300 for, and yet it's 100% free when you go to bioptimizer.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Dot com. Once you're there, just enter your name and email to get the first three phases of the bioptimization report. You'll get the report immediately and begin getting your video lessons each and every day from there on in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wade T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we're going to talk about a really important topic, and that is how to test your biological age. We're also going to talk about testosterone levels and what's normal because there's a lot of confusion about these things. And we had the good fortune today of having Dr. Paulvin, who has certifications in family medicine, osteopathic manipulation, anti-aging and regenerative medicine. His practice in Manhattan combines traditional and alternative medicine to help patients live a healthy lifestyle and perform at their best. He specializes in peptide therapy, sports medicine, mitochondrial health, bioidentical hormone therapy, longevity medicine, and the brain-gut connection. Dr. Paulvin is recognized for his exceptional work applying a hyper-personal approach to help his patients, including Fortune 500 executives, Olympic athletes, and A-list celebrities. And he joins us today out of his busy practice in Manhattan to share some insights on these topics. Dr. Paulvin, welcome to the show. Thanks, glad to be here. So this is, in my opinion, the ex most exciting part of medicine today right now exactly what you're practicing and i'm going to preface this with our listeners this week marks our 20th anniversary uh, in bioptimizers and when matt and i first started the company we were uh, essentially a bodybuilding company uh, i was a natural base bodybuilding champion and we were looking at advancing technology to live a strong live a a long period of time. We had a CD because back then there was no, you know, there's no, it was boards. There was no social media or anything like that. And we, so we had to record the CD and on the CD, we had this thing about far out freaky theories. And back then we understood that muscle mass was part of the longevity equation. We understood that uh, restriction of calories was part of the longevity. And we believed at that time that there would be a massive interest in focus on the development of technologies in the future to extend life and more, more than just extend life, the, the quality of life using what we felt was be, going to be derivatives of the bodybuilding industry. And why I'm saying that, and we'll get to your story in a second, is because bodybuilding or, bodybuilders were the original biohackers, in my opinion. That means they were trying to overcome two significant biological tendencies. One, the ability to increase muscle mass above of what you need to function. And two, to lower body fat levels to levels that are probably sub-healthy. So why, why is that important? Well, basically we have all of these genetic and biological mechanisms that are trying to go to this homeostasis stasis. And medicine, if you look in the 1960s, came out, and if we look at the life expectancy in the in, in the 1960s in Canada, where we're both from, Matt and I, I know you're from the states, but similar to the United States, the United States, we had around 67 years old they expected for people, and the reason that was is that's why they had the social uh, uh, programs for retirees. They said we're going to have to pay these for two years. Well, 
Medical science, unfortunately, extended that to around 80. <laughs> it was like a 20% miscalculation by the government. And so they had to borrow from all these programs to pay all these people. Bring them. And a lot of that, I believe, was because of surgery uh, upgrades. You know, the interventions between people took heart attacks, strokes, diseases, car accidents, etc. Surgery procedures uh, went excessively in that favor. And I do believe that uh, Dr. Filzer, who put the first stent in the body, uh, from Harvard, he's a friend of mine who's on the podcast years ago, and uh, he talked about this specifically from you know surgery as it's evolved. Medicines kind of solved, you know, in the turn of the century, solved all the, you know, like bacterial infection is probably one of the big things that it it, it did. But what you're talking about in your area of focus right now is a whole new emerging set of medicine, which we kind of hoped for 20 years ago, but now it's here now, and that is really creating superhumans that extend past the capabilities of what we expect for a normal lifespan. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely now the it's there. I think we're at the point we now know we have the data and the, and the technology now is harnessing it to give us the biggest bang for the buck, literally and figuratively. So I think we're, get, we're getting really close for the people who want to be guinea pigs or, or the first people who want to be the first in anything, it's right there. Um, but there's still some fine tuning, but there's definitely a lot of great tools, both data wise and being able to use, utilize that data. So I want to talk a little bit about your background and how you got into this osteopathic manipulation and then to anti aging regenerative medicine. So, how did you go into? Osteopathic, you know, the, those those don't nest. That's not really a common direction. Because maybe I mean, actually, you can explain that. Yeah, there's actually a bit. I mean, there's actually a flow to it in the sense that when I started out X amount of years ago, at this point over twenty, um, I was dealing with a lot of. I had a lot of. I was in a more rural area. Um, I wasn't in Manhattan, and we were having a lot. I had a lot of patients who from sport injuries, kind of what you were describing. They wanted to either maximize performance. Or and and or just heal from injuries quicker, and that's when things like PRP were just coming to the foreground, and some supplements, but nothing like we have now. And they were again, so it kind of put me down the rabbit hole there. And I was also dealing with patients who, unfortunately, I was doing a lot of patients who had chronic illnesses, be it um, Alzheimer's, Lyme disease, things like that, and they were looking for the non-traditional treatments. And that sent me initially into things like hormones and lab testing and, and the gut, and then now into the, into the brain. And that kind of the functional medicine, I guess, or integrative uh, rabbit hole kind of begot now the, the biohacking, anti-aging section of it. It's kind of exploded because, again, none of this was around 20 years ago. I mean, we were doing very basic tests and doing much simpler. I mean, again, the most technology thing we were really doing back then was things like PRP and um, acupuncture. So again, it, it it just kind of, how do I help people has always been the question. How do I help you with the newest and things that actually work? And that's where I ended up here. Right. We called our company Bioptimizers um, because we believed in a topic we called biological optimization. So how do I optimize the aspects within the human physiology to give me the most amount of perform or the, or the, the a balance between top end performance and duration or longevity of performance in regards to a lifespan, as opposed to like an athlete looks at maximization of performance parameters. And there is a trade-off. There's a, there's a consequence. If you want to go be an NFL football player, you want to be a professional boxer, or you want to be an MMA guy or whatever that, or soccer player, whatever inevitably all athletes careers end before most people's careers take off in other words you're pretty much done by the time you're in your mid 30s as a professional athlete and most people don't really hit their stride until maybe their late 30s early 40s uh, in a professional career so my question to you is who is the type of person coming into your clinic today and why are they coming into the clinic to begin with? It's pivoted completely, which is cool. I mean, I love the part of the I do what I do is the it's it's not cookie cutter at all. It, it was three, four years ago, it was more 
in this space looking for the newest, coolest thing. Now, because of everybody from Peter Atia to Tony Robbins, now it's people who want to know how to cull through all the, 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 the noise out there in terms of, I want to live my best life now. I want to potentially live till I'm 90. I want to know how to use the data that's available to me, but understand it and, and, and make it usable, not like foreign language. I want to know what, how do I use these, how do I use peptides? How do I do IVs? How do I do this? And kind of, I'm like, I'm the conductor, I'm the tour guy, whatever analogy you want to use there. There's so much noise out there. There's so many good things and bad things out there in terms of what people are describing. And that's where they're coming for now. They, they want, they come in with, most of my patients now come in with an extreme knowledge base, which is awesome. They, they, they speak the talk, which makes my life a lot easier. I mean, it's it kind of interesting when I have, oh, my, my husband wanted me to come in or my, or my whatever one. And, they, and they're like, like, what do you know about ABRC? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And it's still, we can still definitely help those people. But I mean, I have people who really want to push, they want to be an 11. They want to live to 120. They want to, again, they want to have, they want to look good, feel good and, and perform well. What would the age demographics and maybe gender demographics be on that? Um, the demo, the demo, it's, I mean, it's still, it's probably, it, I have everybody. I mean, I have a 17 year old and I have a 92 year old, but it's wow. probably tw 27 to 55. Yeah. And it, I'm probably now 60, 40 male, which yep. I've never, I've never been male dominant ever. The last year to two years, I've flip flopped a little bit especially with the advent of peptides, um, but it's now male skewed a little bit. So typically when a person comes in, um, one of the things that there's a couple of markers that I think a lot of people are paying attention to, and I want to know how relevant it is for that picture versus maybe some things they could be. So a lot of people will go and uh, the, the, sexual dysfunction and they go get their hormones tested and they got low testosterone and that starts them down that then there's this whole thing around biological age what constitutes that what's the best test there's genetic stuff and all this sort of stuff and so often we do expect the decline in hormones as we go get older but some of the times that hormone precipice has fallen off way too early in that and it's it, that's kind of everything so how do you determine what a person like when a person comes into the clinic, what what do they what how do you determine what's right for them or the, is the patient dictated or do you say, well, you're thinking this, but really there's these issues prior a priori? It's mostly in most cases, the basic stuff is me. They're all going to get this a very base a very comprehensive micro uh, biomarker panel and basic lab work, no matter what. Um, most of my patients now are getting a biological age test done, various ones for different reasons. Um, those are the kind of the core. I mean, a lot of my patients now are also getting a lot of cancer screening, liquid biopsy and the full body MRI testing done. That's just because the set patients I have. Um, and then beyond that, it's kind of individual. Um, cause again, there's two pieces to it. A, part of it, unfortunately, a lot of these tests are not covered by insurance, a lot of them, and B, and it's happened more and more is some people just don't want to know everything. There's people who don't want to know and there's people who want to know everything down to the nitty gritty. And I always make them aware of that. It's come out, um, especially since uh, the Peter Tier, Chris Hemsworth thing last year, where he came back positive for APOE4, which is an Alzheimer's precursor gene. And some people, 70% of people were like, yes, I, I want to know, I want to know. They were like, no, I want to live my life. I don't want to know. I don't want to have Big Brother watching or anything else. And they're like, well, I'll just take the basics and use that. Um, so again, too much, some people don't want every piece of information down to their whole genome done. And I totally understand that. And I explained the kind of the plus and the minuses to them. What, um, biological tests do you feel are most accurate? Cause you said just, there, there's, there's a lot of, you know, opinions out there about which ones to do and why you would do them and why you might not do one. What, what, what constitutes a good test and which ones do you prefer? Biological age test we're talking about specifically. Yeah. Um, I mean, number one is the, is the Dunedin Pace, which is um, has the most data behind of any of them. I mean, no matter what test you're doing, you want some. You want to know how it's um, has good data proven that it works. It's accurate. Number one, 
And with these biological age tests, it's like a, a lot of the computer things we're having now, the more data that's inputted into the system, the better and more accurate and consistent results you're going to get. We're seeing with AI and all those other things as well, where it's based on one thing, it's not going to be work as well. So Dunedin Pace kind of has both those kind of nailed down. And there's links we know that, the way we explain to patients, Dunedin Pace, exactly what it sounds like, is kind of like the but the um the speedometer of aging, where it's gonna it's vacillating more quicker, getting more data with it, where it's not just kind of more fixed. And then all the other tests are more of the odometer with a, a measure of where you've been, and it's kind of more of a fixed number, but you still can change both. It's kind of how I try to explain it to patients. The main case is by far number one. The MO mix test that's coming out from two diagnostics is number two, and then glycanate, which is a whole kind of different scientific method. It's probably number three. And there's other tests that are out there that are good. Yeah. Um, but those are kind of the three that I recommend my patients use. And then we we add in more for the patients who want it. Now, this is really important because we've all witnessed this with someone who maybe um, has gone through a stressful period of type and, and, you know, they come back and you go, oh, my God, they look like they age 20 years or 10 years or something like that. So that's kind of the the speed of aging. Is there genetic markers that would indicate, for example, if we look at human history, uh, life expectancy was, for most of human history, was what, under 40 years old for most of recognized history. In other words, the genes that allowed you to maybe be strong and live very quickly and survive under very difficult conditions and replicate and extend your genes into time may not be the same genes that allow you to live a long life. Is there any correlation between like, you know, or is there any way of testing which genes are actually better for longevity, but not might not be best for maximization if, 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 you, if you would look? Um, it's presumed. It's not been nailed down yet. They're mm -hmm. doing that now. I mean, you've heard, again, with all these new TV specials, there's a group of patients called super agers that are living to 90 and 100, especially over 100, the centenarians. They're doing some genetics on them now. It's more kind of the other way around. We're now knowing it's certain behaviors um, in terms of being positive, having community, um, again, exercise and sleep as opposed to a specific gene. Um, they also do have less epigenetic damage, um, which is from methylation, oxidative stress, and the other factors as well. But it's mainly we're finding more correlation between lifestyle and other factors opposed to a specific gene. Which is really uh, great news. So in other words, that if you develop the habits and lifestyle and structure around these, you know, life supporting behaviors, it seems to get the most out of whatever you inherited in the genes thing. Exactly. Uh, in the genes lotto. Now, if you have, say, suboptimal genes for certain um, components and you've identified that with a test or early on in your testing or do you focus on counteracting those things first or do you focus on maybe enhancing uh, positive express positive genes? Like how do you how do you work that out? Like diet or okay. it's all it's all the above. I, mean, I practice what I call a safety deposit box method in the sense that you have to turn all the keys at the same time. Because if I'm just working on fixing your epigenetics, or I'm just working on making sure you work out three times a week and your diet's good, you're still the other parts kind of exponentially getting worse. So you've got to do, if you work on and some things overlap. We know that a healthy diet, Mediterranean diet, caloric restriction is going to help you optimize your health in the moment, and also it's going to help fix your genetics. It's also going to fix your epigenetics. It's also going to fix some of the bad heart genetic markers or bad genetic cholesterol markers or so on. So there's a lot. The goal, I mean, to kind of answer your simple answer is we're looking at the optimally there's certain things that, that do both. They are work in the short term and on the gene part at the same time. Appropriate diet, exercise, um, caloric restriction. Those are the ones we know right now. Uh, we know alcohol, decreasing alcohol use and smoking are kind of the, the heavy, the, the low hanging fruit at this point. And then other things you kind of have to, do both sides of the fence in terms of working. Otherwise, it's gonna it's like whack-a-mole. You're trying to chase something the whole time. Is that maybe one of the problems 
um, in the biohacking space that something catches trends and it becomes the be all end all catch all and everybody jumps on board with this quote unquote hack. But first, it's not universally applicable or it may cause uh, people to erroneously focus time, effort and energy on something that's not necessarily cued to them. Yeah, we're, we're at that point now. I mean, I think it's biohacking is inevitably this to begin with. That's why people, some people don't like the term to begin with because they feel some of it's people don't know. Aren't, most people don't know the difference between something that's real. Like we know certain things that you can biohack are great and they work well and they have data for 20 years on is other things that people talk about that have no data behind it and they just look cool and they're on the right podcast or they look have a really cool Instagram channel and it explodes. And now I mean, we're seeing more and more like kind of the. The, the truth tellers that have come out kind of saying, look, this is, this is ridiculous. Don't, don't listen to A, B or C at this point. So um, it's, it's definitely the horse is out of the barn. It's a little, it's a wild, wild west right now. Right. So as a physician and someone who has the background training experience, both academically, as well as, you know, with your exposure to your clinical practice. And I think, I think you can't overestimate the combination of those two things. I think that's really critical. There's like kind of people that fall into the research area and then there's people that follow into the clinical, but you got, you know, to be a, become a, a medical professional, you got to have this in-depth capability to understand a lot of complex biological systems. But if you're just stuck in a lab somewhere, that doesn't always translate into the real world. As, 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 as in your experience, what do you think are the things that people need to kind of check off their list if they're looking to be one of these people that lives long and strong in their life? And and how soon they, should they start doing that? Yesterday at this point? Um, I mean, it, again, the, it's a core four to begin with. It's exercise. And now we're getting more nitty gritty in terms of what they should be doing. And how you do it is individual. I mean, you can be a power lifter. You can lift 10 pounds. You can do some Pilates. Again, you can get to that same point in different ways. But we know 60, 90 minutes, at least of resistance weight-bearing exercise a week. Again, some people do much higher, and that's fine. Um, we know that, again, we, part, we want to do partly, again, in terms of VO2, to, uh, not VO2, zone 2 type workout, and as well as doing maximal work. Uh, what they call VO2 max workouts now, four by fours, where you go as hard as you can for four minutes and rest for four minutes. I mean, that number one, number two, maximizing your sleep. Number three is your diet. It doesn't have to, not everybody has to be on the same diet. And you know, I mean, the book behind you there, it's finding that right diet that works for you and that correlates with how you feel and as well as your what your markers are. Um, and then, and then it's just like lifestyle and stress reduction. Those are the core things that you could start yesterday. Um, and then it becomes, again, I, then the other things become caloric restriction. Other things become using things like sauna uh, multiple times a week if possible. And then you can build on and build on and build on those foundations. Again, like I said, connection. We know positivity, connection, which anybody can do. Um, and then go from there. I mean, there's you can't, I mean, there's all the books say you can't change seven things at one time. It's You're not going to do it. Yes. So that's kind of why I make sure I make patients aware that they want 14 things at once. It's like, no, I'm not going to do it because it's, it's not going to work and you're going to yell at me in three months. And then we're back to square one again. So um, here's a great thing. So on a recent podcast, I was a guest of a, a well-known uh, biohacker in the space. And we, we were, and, and our, our application of certain things, um, this individual is all about shoot this, take this, dump the, you know, like just every great new thing, let's bring it into the system and test it uh, and reduce exercise to its absolute minimal component. In other words, the person does exercise, you know, so they're on that far end of the biohacking. What, what is the least amount I can do and get the most events? And they're not an athletic, they didn't start out as an athlete. Now, in my own case, in Matt's case would go into this. Like we've been weight training fanatics for a long period of time. Uh, we, we, we were looking way back in the day to the Wolford studies, uh, the, one of the original anti-aging guys. I also, some other people that I followed 
interesting wolf will had those bubble experiments you know where they they had the people in the, <laughs> that didn't work out very well it was a nice theory but it failed hard um and then like last year i moved in from just weight bearing stuff to really starting to co focus on my vo2 max and made great gains in a very short period of time uh on vo2 max and that sort of stuff sleep diet we've kind of optimized for those things so for people like us who are we have the exercise program down. We like and do it. And that's easy. We're focusing on our sleep. We're focusing on our diet, all that sort of stuff. But we're in, like, I'm in my uh, early fifties. Where do I, I, I come into your clinic. I say, Hey, you know what? I've got this down. I got my diet down, got my training down, got my sleep down. I've got a great community. I've got a great business. My financial things in order, but I want more. Uh, you've got a whole host of things. Hormone therapy, peptide therapy. I'm sure you're probably doing like mitochondrial function. Like, uh, but where, where is, where, where is that focus going to be? Assuming that my gut's good, my brain's good. There's no dysfunction inside of the physiology, but I want to start adding some of these adjuncts to optimize stuff. How do you go about selecting that? Yeah, there's there's different buckets. So I mean, there are. I mean, I'll start with. I mean, the prescription medicines, there's the rapamycins, there's the acrobosis, there's now, I mean, I say just came out recently about azazanthine in terms of being an anti-aging supplement. So, I mean, my patients who want to do it, we will start them, again, at the right age with the correct lab work, they will do pres certain prescription medicines to help potentially get get their their system age of pro even better than they were. I mean, because we know these medicines are going to potentially help with brain health. They're going to inhibit mTOR, which has a, a huge effect on aging and other factors. We're seeing other great things in terms of anti-inflammatory, immune modulating. So that's the number. That's one thing you mentioned. Then we are working on optimizing hormones. Um, that is probably the biggest um, if you talk to 10 doctors who are in the space who are good at what they do, they're going to give you 10 different answers of where you should be. I mean, with men, it's, with men, it's really, um, where should my testosterone be? And I, I correlate their behavior, how they feel and what the numbers are showing. And it's not just a total testosterone. It's really, it's a whole number, the whole lab package because your total could be high or low but there may be five other reasons behind it. Me giving you more testosterone is may or may not fix the problem. Um, and then the females, it's now more, it's doing the whole hormone package of estrogen, progesterone, women need testosterone in most cases. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hormone optimization. And then now we're getting into um, the organ aging improvement. Mm. In terms of what I mean by that, there are people now who are working on dealing with the decay of your immune system, like everything else, your immune system decays after the age of 30 or 40. You have problems with your pituitary and your what's called your pineal gland, which produces melatonin. There are people now doing what are called pepti peptide bioregulators and other techniques to kind of you make their immune system young again. Mm -hmm. so they're doing that. We're now doing specific things to make your brain younger, things like hyperbaric or certain supplementation for that. People now with the advent of the next six months of being able to age your organs. So we, we will know what your age of your liver is and the age of your brain is and your age of your intestines are and your so on and so forth. We can target that specifically. Um, so that we do that with, again, with peptides, hormone replacement, sub, there's certain supplements, things like urolithin A, which I think should be in the water at this point. Um, things like MitoQ and other supplements as well, and your supplements as well, can kind of get them to that point. Um, and then there's, again, there's so technology all over the place that works really well. I mean, the big three are hyperbaric, sauna, red light therapy. This, again, you go into the, IV, the IVs, which could be from a $200 Myers cocktail, which doesn't do much, to now, we do peptide IVs to stem cell IVs, especially out of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the other thing we're going to. Now we've hit, I mean, I've had multiple patients today. Half of them are going out of the country to pursue various things um, yeah. from that are out there because they're not available here. And I have patients who my European patients are coming here for certain things. Global tourism is 
is the bio optimizer biohackers dream at this point that and it's kind of like it's it's become commonplace um the stem cells exosomes and then file statin ivs which is a way to help build muscle and get your um whatchamacallit get your your weight your visual fat down and get your weight down and build muscle so all these different things are out there and then you have of course of all the tech gadgets and we can go on, on forever um, yep. I mean, the other thing I'll really point out is it's getting the, the high-end data first. It's getting a biological age test. It's getting a DEXA, st- a DEXA scan with a, bio- a metabolic component to it. It's getting a, VO2, a good VO2 max test done. Because that, if the data is, we don't have the data, you're kind of guessing. And you also not able to track what you're doing because you may want, for you, you may want to be lifting heavy to get to your goal. I don't lift heavy. I just never will. I can't, do, I have a bad shoulder. It doesn't happen for me, so I have to augment in different ways. So get the data, and then there's so much stuff to play with now. But again, I tell my patients when they come in, how many things do you want to do at one time? How many things, where where do you want to be in two years? And some patients want to be doing, again, everything, which is fine. And we build up a ramp-up program for them. Other patients just want to fix their hormones and maybe do some sauna and have a couple supplements out there, and that's what they are. So everybody's individual. If you were to kind of classify maybe the top, I don't know, five things um, from the medical side that you're seeing that, that are solving problems that people are coming into the clinic are, what would you say those those items would be? Um, in a vacuum, because I mean, every, again, every yeah, I know you can't. I know because it, what one man what. Yeah, you could say, okay, well, hormone therapy, but someone comes in with great hormones, you don't need that. No, no, what I mean is every depending, actually, it really depends on where you live at this point. So in a vacuum, just if you, if you could do anything you wanted to, the yeah. things that I've seen, the great, I mean, peptides are definitely on that list. Hormone replacement is definitely on that list. Um, EBO and plasmapheresis, which has kind of been a new entree into the... What's that? Plasma? EBO, EBO and plasmapheresis. Yep. That's where they're taking the, that's where they're taking the blood out of the system, cleaning the blood and pop you back in with it, with that. Right? It's an oil change for the body, which is, I yep. mean, we're seeing between everything from biological health, um, biological age changes to patients who have autoimmune conditions like MS or something, and they feel a hundred times better. So, and bring a hundred other benefits to it. Um, stem cell exosomes, I think are definitely again in a vacuum and then probably the high end, prescriptions like things like rapamycin and is probably the last one if you give me five okay great so in the world of let, let's let's kind of dive into a couple of those areas because you know there's so much confusion and one of the things that concerns me is that people randomly shotgun something because they heard it on a podcast and they thought oh well this peptide is going to be great and you know right now i i i know a lot of young influencers and they're way down the peptide program in other words they're taking all kinds of peptides to build muscle or lose body fat or do whatever what would you say the pros and cons of peptide therapy is if there is any on those sides of things and and then what were what what are peptides that you think are totally safe and some that might be sketchy? If there's some that are out there that you're like, I, I would avoid those, and those are ones that are probably are okay for people, just as a general generalization. Yeah, no, in general, I mean, I would say, I mean, the pro with peptides from a, with a caveat for all this that you're getting things from a reputable farm, reputable source. Yeah. That's the caveat with all these things. So I'll say that the one time is most peptides are helpful. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, the way I explain it, they come in four or five different buckets and they can help with almost anything. People, the down, only con to them is really two things. And a, well, actually, it's A, people don't know how to dose them or dosing them too high. People think that they're the only thing you need to be taking. And that's kind of a combination of some social media stuff. And just like you said, people are just going down the rabbit hole. And the, under, the lack of understanding that you need to A, for benefit, maximal benefit, you want to stack them for people don't stacking means that a group is is more beneficial than just individually taking the peptides and you also are cycling them you're not something you don't want to be on any peptide except for again in rare cases where i've used them for patients who have like a, a, a sports injury where we've had them on for a decent period of time you're cycling you go on you go off there's enough peptides and other things out there now where you can do something for three or four months 
then we add something else if you need it and you go back on it you, to do more is not better and that's kind of the whole yep. concern a little bit with the whole biohacking space understanding the nuance that more is not better using it to its optimal benefit and then tracking where you are is really where it works um but the, i mean the fact that the, the 90 percent of them work well and with minimal side effects in most cases i mean that's a, a win-win um the only other downside for people don't like injecting themselves but that's actually dramatically changed over the last couple of years too and with peptides do you do you feel that the uh injections are superior than say orally or would you like uh what people are doing IV? for a majority of them injection are better i mean there's some that are no sprays and like C-Max or C-Lank are nose sprays and they work really well. Um, those exceptions, but most cases, the injections are, are the best. I mean, I do, I have some IV peptides and they work even better, but that's not the norm for most people and not necessary in most cases to do continuously. We usually do it, um, what's my call? We usually kind of do it as, as a loading dose and yeah. then have them send them home on their injections. I mean, there's a couple, I mean, the only ones I can think of is probably cerebrolysin, which we do IV a lot of, because you can't get the dose otherwise. It's probably the only one which is kind of its own exception to the rule. And that's a great one for brain health and cognitive function. Oh, I mean, I love. I mean, the data. I mean, it's it's amazing to me the data. They have so much data from like fifty years ago, and then nobody talks about it. It's really frustrating, but data is, is really good. Well, there was a lot of peptides developed out of the Soviet Union, from my understanding, mm -hmm. and the the knowledge in Russia is. Uh, seems to be far superior than what we have in North America. I actually have a, a Russian lady on staff who actually gets data because she can read the Russian literature and she can has access to, you know, people that are doing this 30, 40 years ago, as well as some other Eastern European doctors who w knew about these things when they were practicing in Eastern Europe 30 years ago, but now are uh, at the forefront here. So it's very interesting. Yeah, they used it for the army and other things and they mastered it and now we just have never caught up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other favorites in the peptide thing? Uh, for I mean, I love a couple of them. I, I mean, I, I mean, I think everybody knows BBC 157. Yeah. It's so multifunctional and very minimal side effects. I love Mott C because it's once a week, but it just, again, it does a lot. I love, I love anything that's going to do seven check marks instead of one. Um, yep. you, again, we, as we just already got through, I mean, you, otherwise you're going to be doing a hundred things at one time. Those, the, and the Cibre license are probably my three favorite at this point. I mean, the, um, if, I, if I had to pick three. And any, um, any um, peptides that you would tell people it's the juice isn't worth the squeeze from your observation. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheap meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on Masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. And there's two answers to that. The ones I would be is a little bit different answer is the growth hormone peptides. I mean, they're not always a home run. Use they they can be helpful, but I think people think they are like God's gift to everything. And they're for muscle for muscle building on one end, for weight loss on the other end. And they they help. I mean, they're good when used the right way, like I talked about before. But they're not like some just panacea for everything. So I think yeah. there's a little bit, and the other ones I would say, and just in terms of the two that just don't have the bang for the buck are DSIP for sleep for most people and kiss peptin people were talking about it for testosterone. I just have not seen a huge bang for the buck for that one either. Um, just, but there are people who, who like it. So let's jump uh, from peptides to hormones. Um, so 
so there's an interesting there's, there's an interesting debate uh, certainly in the muscle building community, and I'd like to get your you to weigh in on it. And and for a lot of people, just to context this from a longevity perspective, muscle is one of the you know the big metabolic factors as well as quality of life factors, especially as you age and your hormones decrease. And maintaining muscle requires both exercise. Uh, a, a diet that supports that exercise, but it also needs hormone strength. Now, a lot of guys started, you know, they didn't want to go into hormones. They didn't want to go into hormones. So they would start using peptides instead to augment muscle building capability or uh, athletic performance. I would like for you to kind of weigh the pros and cons against, you know, optimizing your hormones rather than, you know, cycling through peptides or which one would you choose or how would you use them in conjunction? Okay. That's an interesting question. I'm just trying to how to answer. So it depends on who, what, where it, it really depends on where somebody is, what their goals are short term, like with the next six months. Mm -hmm. um, is, or, and then what, honestly, what sport they are. I mean, is, I'm going to treat a basketball player different than somebody who's trying to, who has a bodybuilding competition coming up in three months right. early. Um, so again, in the perfect world, I love combining both together because you're going to get the, obviously the biggest bang for the buck in most cases is from 80% of my athletes. I would do more peptide stuff with a little bit of hormone optimization unless the hormones are in the toilet. I mean, if their testosterone comes in at 200, if their DHEA is horrible, um, or the LH, like some of the other lower level hormones are all, way, way off, then they have to fix because nothing is gonna do much unless you can't be walking around at 200 or something like that. Assuming yeah. they're somewhat close, it's peptides, except for my athletes who are all their main number one goal is I need to put on more muscle, then it's, hormone optimization, even going to like hormones at a 10 and then augmenting that with the peptides, like with the, everybody knows that the Wolverine stack, which is CJC, BPC and thymus and beta four, and then throwing in mod C because of the mitochondrial effect. And it may help VO2 max. It may help work out to some extent, also boost AMPK and so on and insulin and all those things. So that's, again, it all depends on who I'm dealing with. Again, it's very individual, but again, most of my patients, I would say peptides, because the way peptides are usually going to be more positive, testosterone replacement, especially if you go to a higher, higher level of athletes is, it's kind of like, it's kind of explaining like a 17 year old driving a Ferrari. It's very powerful and you it hopefully it stays on the road, but it may go off and then, oh my God, I'm, I'm losing my hair. I'm, my, I'm, I'm getting man breaths. Right. Or, and then it's like, what did you do? And then peptides you don't have you're not going to go off the road but people, right. people who want testosterone understand there's a huge bang for the buck but you may go off the road a little bit but and i have a lot of these cheesy now that kind of explain to patients because they just think there's no bad with any of these but that's kind of how i look at it with most patients um but there's usually a mix and match but again i'm more peptide guy than testosterone guy interesting and then um from a cycling perspective, you I think you said what three four months is usually the top end on a on a given peptide that you want to come off it. Usually, yeah. I mean, I'm, that's where I am in, for, in most cases. Again, unless I'm dealing with serious injury, like so I've had patients with severe rotator cuff um, or severe disc, or like coming off like an ACL repair or something like that, where it's a little bit different. But overall, that's where I'm. That's where my head is at now. I know how to how, what to mix and match. Um, there's enough out there now compared to a couple of years ago, where it was really wasn't as much available. Do you find the, so one of the things, so I think a lot of people still misidentify testosterone or bodybuilding drug, drug tracks versus hormone optimization versus peptides. Now in the bodybuilding world, if you take a lot of hormones, like, you know, super physiological dosages, you gain, you know, prodigious amounts of muscle, lose prodigious amounts of body fat. And have prodigious amounts of side effects. <laughs> Hormone optimization, you're kind of putting yourself in the optimal zone, but uh, in, you know, you see increases of muscle mass or lower the body fat percentage, which is usually the cosmetic side or the health related side of that thing. But relative to those things, like how does peptides differ from those things? Like do, when you come off a 
when you look at athletes that, you know, a great example of this was the UFC athletes, once they brought in the WADA testing, well, you saw all of the athletes just look completely different within it a year. Um, is the gains from te peptides the same as, say, hormone augmentation versus like hormone regu super no, regulation? No, I mean, the steel, one first caveat is event athletes, like again, somebody trained for a bodybuilding or a UFC fighter, they are targeting three months down the road and then they're coming on. That's a different conversation that you are maximizing. Their hormones are the first, or probably, I should say, to me, that's the first thing. Somebody who is a six month season athlete, it's a little bit different. Taking WADA, again, that's kind of out of the equation. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, testosterone has a higher, hormonal optimization has a higher ceiling for most people. In terms of performance, in terms of recovery, the peptides have a higher ceiling. So yeah. again, you want to, with lifting and training, you need to have both because we know that, I mean, if you're, if you have high inflammatory markers, if you have poor gut health, high LPS, all these other things, your muscle building is going to be affected as well as you're going to be in more pain, which is going to affect your cognitive performance and it snowballs on you. So it's a seesaw and you want to, in perfect world, you want to have both. But again, with event-based performer, event-based athletes, you're going to have the testosterone, the hormone optimization up a little bit more than the recovery part, but you still need recovery. Otherwise, I mean, again, you're, you're going to end up almost in the same spot potentially. So... Now, does peptides disrupt sperm count like hormone, like hormone therapy can? There's some, it's out there. I want some, there's no definitive data. There's a couple, some people have said it with BBC. Some people have said it with GHK copper. I mean, the data are so small that it's not, there's so much um, was it, interference in the study that you just don't know for sure. I have never had any patient tell me that. I mean, a lot of these, anything that's not made by a pharmaceutical company or a huge supplement company can't, is not going to get tested. Do these, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these tests cost millions to $10 million. They're not, it's just not there. Um, it's not going to happen. I mean, again, Ru again, the Russians have done the most studies on most of the peptides that are out there. Unless a pharmaceutical company has tried to bring some of these peptides to market, and then there's better data. Like Tessa Morellin, which is the what I call the Ferrari of the growth hormone peptides has better data than anybody any of the other ones do because they try to it's a, it's partly a pharmaceutical drug um, they use for other things, um, but it's, it's not I haven't seen it in in actuality. Now with hormone replacement therapy, does that disrupt uh, uh, sperm counts and people having yes. kids things like that? Yes. That's why you're on that's why you're on HCG. That's why you're on aroma. I mean, especially HCG. Um, it will decrease fertility. We have our patients look, Hey, if you're looking to have a child three to six months before you need to stop the testosterone. Um, if you're doing the injection method, if you're doing things like enclomophane or clomid, not as much could be they use them for boosting fertility for men and women. So it's, if you're just specifically doing the, the injections. Got it. Okay, great. That's, that solves a lot of questions that I get in around that. And I want to, thanks for weighing in on those things. Let's uh, switch gears now to the Evo. And can you share with people? I first got exposed to that uh, about a decade ago. I was actually in Bali, Indonesia, and they had this technology. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. It's kind of like <laughs> the new version of bloodletting without leaking all your blood all over the place. <laughs> it kind of regenerates it. <laughs> so can you talk about this technology and, and why you think it's valuable from a health perspective? Um, EBO is what they call ozone, pretty much another word for EBO, uh, EBO uh, ozone dialysis. Um, there are different machines out there that do a different process. Um, pretty much what it is, you get a, an IV, a large IV needle in both arms. And kind of like we said, what you're doing is a cleaning of the blood. This method compared to like plasma is a little bit different is where you're taking ozone, which is a gas, an oxygen gas, and a lot of them now have some type of light, color, colored light in there, different spectrums of light. Some have green light, some have blue light, some have all of the above, some you can change them as the people think that certain wavelengths of light are anti-inflammatory, certain people think they're antibacterial. The data is not completely out one way or the other on that part of it yet. Um, and then what that does is that the, the blood is pumped through there in, out, in one, out the other, out one, in the other, through different machinery. Again, there's some that are kind of like basic and some that are like Ferraris, where you get 
are literally like a bucket of foam. It looks like a little like the foam party, old school foam party, where that's the toxins and the dead cells and where it's removed. We used it, and now there's some smaller studies that show it helps with mitochondrial function, where you it may help with, in terms of um, athletic performance. It may help in terms of detoxing, just general detox, not from medications. Um, we're using it also now for some patients who have cognitive issues. Um, it's also been, so it, it's used both on the anti-aging front as well as for we're using it in like you know, Alzheimer's, a lot of neuro, neurodegenerative patients, um, a lot of patients with a chronic Lyme as well, a lot of chronic infections. So it works really well because it takes out um, some of the toxins. It doesn't bind antibodies like plasmapheresis or by, uh, transfer exchange does, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very useful uh, tool now that's gaining more and more popularity. Um, the only thing with that compared to some other tools, there's a huge difference in operator experience. And there's also a huge difference between the the, the the machinery itself. Some are kind of getting very basic and yeah. some are like, again, are souped up and really work a little bit better. So it's not like, I can't have a good example. If you're getting an x-ray, the x-ray machine is pretty much the same wherever you go at this point versus these well, machines, there's a huge disparity. Infrared saunas, sauna, the sauna technology. That there's exactly, a, same idea. Yeah. Wide variance. Variance. All those different things now. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great thing. Uh, what was the other thing that you used? The plasma, what was that? It's called plasmapheresis or, to, or tra, uh, 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 transfer exchange. It's been used for years in hospitals for like patients who have, um, unfortunately, like rapid kidney uh, deterioration. So it yeah. takes out all the bad stuff and then purifies and hopefully the body can adapt. Um, they start also using it, like I mentioned, in patients with auto, um, autoimmune issues like MS, like multiple sclerosis, where they find it may help bind the antibodies and limit and hopefully lessen the symptoms or patients who have had a, almost their symptoms disappear with it if we have some type of neurological issue. And then also now there's, again, we know it helps athletic performance because it's taking all the toxins and a lot of the inflammatory chemicals out of your body. Um, people who've checked their biological age has dropped some cases 15 years within like a month after wow. doing it, which has, so there is some data showing how quickly um, it does work. Um, it is costly. It's one of the more costly things out there at this point. It's not, I mean, literally, I mean, in Manhattan, which is probably one of the bigger biohacking health optimization communities, there's nobody who has it yet. Um, it's coming soon, but it's harder to find, but it's there. How do you do plasma transfer exchange? Because I know it's with the, it's, it's, you know, the machine. It's kind of similar. It's, it's a yeah. similar setup. It's a different machine. It's bigger IVs in both arms. It's just a more complicated as a separate filter. There's no ozone. There's no, in most cases, there's no color light associated with it. It's just a complicated filtering system. It's a medical device that people are now using for optimization. And are you are you in are you putting in any extra plasma or something into the body from external sources? Is, they or can. There's people who are adding in stem cells. It depends who's doing a stem cell exosome peptides. There's different protocols. I mean, we do the same with EBO. When we do EBO, I don't. Um, if the doctor I work with who does EBO, they're we're adding in exosomes a lot of times. Sometimes we're using methylene blue or other peptide IVs, either before yeah. or after, depending on what we're doing with it. So. Um, there are protocols for wh if, whichever end that you're using for health optimization or illness. Yeah, I love it. Uh, this is this is fun stuff. Thanks. This is this is awesome stuff because I think a lot of people have questions about this and they don't they don't know the nuances. So this is this is great. We're gonna go now to the next thing, which is uh, a topic that's getting so much information. That's stem cells, exosomes, and I'm gonna add one other piece. Do you know anything about V cells? So we can start with stem cells and go down the list. Yeah, I mean, for, I mean, stem cells, again, it's a wild, wild west. Um, again, this is probably the most tourism thing that's out there right now because in patients in the United States, you just are so limited in what you can do. Um, there's a lot of new rules that have come out recently where we can't alter them. We can't, you can't alter them. You can't add anything to them. You can't do put them in anything, which has become very troublesome. So a lot of people are going either to other places. Um, so people don't know stem cells are cells that can become anything initially. So in terms of the first piece is that there are now companies out there where you can, when you're born, or even when you're young and healthy, you can store your stem cells. So the data right now, 
and less unfortunate there's cancer right now that it's still kind of not ready for prime time yet in that regard, but it, the, we know that the science will probably be there in five to 10 years, hopefully. Um, so that's the first piece with things to know with stem cells. And then we're using them on multiple fronts for a lot of different things. The question is really, what is the best way to use them? Is it to, in most cases we know, it's to alter them to either add on, um, an inflammatory, anti-inflammatory component to it. Do we put them, are we doing it IV? Are we doing it locally? Um, do we mix them with exosomes? Do you mix them with PRP? It all is very still not, a lot of this is not, um, what you call it? It's not down, it's not a perfect Canada, Not canonized, point. it's more in the experimental phase. It's experimental, exactly. So yeah. it's, it's, it's um, the ones, so there's different ca categories. You have the ones that are kind of middle of the road are the ones that you're gonna get either from your from your abdomen, which is um, done through a liposuction procedure or done through a bone marrow a biopsy in your hip. Those are your obviously your own, which is called autologous stem cell product, uh, treatments. Those are either done and then what we do is you will take that and you spin it down in a special machine and you're gonna inject it in a joint or some people now are using it as an IV product. Yeah. Um, for either general health or we're using it for everything from Alzheimer's to um, multiple sclerosis. And the data in terms of IV stuff is not, has not shown to be great yet. Um, the injection part, um, it's, it's all over the place as well, unfortunately. There's a lot of, um, there are some in terms of the discs, there's a lot of people talking about it for discs and back, but the data doesn't back up at this point yet. In a lot of cases in the US at least, Joints, are, if done correctly, can help more. Um, that's in the U.S. And then when you go out of the country, they are now mixing it in different. The way with the next level is is either is putting it in type of protect like a, a protective bubble or a specific information bubble so it can get to a certain area and do its job and not be broken down and work appropriately. It can be called um, a plasmid or um, there's different companies doing different things, but there's, you need, the body needs more information of how to use them appropriately. And that's being done in Canada. It's being done a lot of the um, South, uh, Central and South America, Panama, Costa Rica, Mexico, um, which is, I know it's not a uh, different area. Um, they're kind of way ahead in terms of the stem cell uh, treatments at this point. That's where people are going. Right. And there's, it's, again, it's not, it's not everybody does it differently. We know that you probably do want to alter the stem cells to do, if you want to be anti-inflammatory, they're altering in one way. If you want them to be more anti-aging, they're altering another way. Exosomes are, they're a little bit are different. They are the communication between your cells. They're called extracellular vesicles or exosomes. They, there's a bunch of studies that are coming really close to showing that they will be helpful. Um, there's some studies, again, for all the things we talked about for joint pain, for brain health, um, they have, tend to have less side effects or less expensive in most cases. They're either given same answer, given locally as a joint injection, they are, or they're given as an IV. They're also used commercially now in a lot of skincare and hair care products. Um, there is no study yet that's come to for total end showing definite benefits with them. The, the second, the kind of two steps behind are showing benefit both in terms of inflammation um, in terms of potentially helping Alzheimer's, again, hopefully in three, two to three years, these studies will come to full growth and they'll show the definitive benefit of it. Um, v cells, I'm not as familiar with. I'm starting to learn more about them now. They are more specific cells um, that are activated by light. Yeah. Um, and the pace, the docs I know who work with them now, they again, kind of goes back to my analogy about a seven channel driving a Ferrari. They're very powerful. The people that they've worked for, they've seen incredible benefits, mostly in the Ill in sick patients, opposed to like an anti aging benefit. I've had again patients who have neurocognitive issues, patients with horrible joint pain, shoulder pain. Uh, I've seen dramatic effect of other people who said, "I spent X amount of money and I didn't feel anything." So we're, mm -hmm. that is the potentially could be the most powerful, but also we still have a ways to go to really know how to use them effectively. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Is, with all these things, work with a doctor who has done numerous cases and is not 
somebody who tells every patient to do stem cells or V cells. Yeah. Because they're not appropriate for everybody. Everybody doesn't need to spend 10, 20, $30,000 on these. But yeah. for the right patient, you can. But again, there's always the red flags as well. Yeah. Great, great info. Um, and I think that the, I think there's a, all of these areas are, are, areas that people need to, you know, if you go through this list, they're going to go to, uh, they're going to find some things that are going to upgrade their life. And that's where the profession, that's where someone like you comes into the equation to look at, okay, here's your genetics, here's your biome, here's your suboptimal, here's your hormones, here's, okay, let's look at the whole picture here. Now, you have this amount of resources, and we can systematically start knocking things out based on your goals and objectives. I want to talk about the last thing on the top five that you put on to, and this is uh, prescription medications that people are using um, for the biological optimization. What prescriptions are people using these days and what are they using them for? Because this is an area that uh, I'm very, um, I don't have a lot of information or understanding of that. I, I've been in the other side of the field and the prescription is really down on the, the medical side. So Tell me more about this area because it sounds extremely interesting. The only thing I heard of, remember back in the day, I think when uh, David Sinclair came on and then really pushed metformin really hard. And then later on, the data came back that that may not have been the best choice. I, I don't know if that's on your list or, or not, or, or if you have a counter argument. So right now, I mean, right now they're waiting for the study to come out. The anti, there's a big metformin anti-aging study that's coming out. Um, again, it's kind of with everything in this field, it was the, pretty much the, like you said, it was the first one out there. So it's better than nothing now yeah. that it's, um, kind of, or all these new kids are coming, new toys are coming. It's gone way down the list. We know it affects muscle growth. Potentially some people have upset stomach with it. It it's, doesn't have a huge bang for the buck. It is good for weight. It is, it, it, is, it, it can induce autophagy, which is important. It can work on, it does work on AMPK. It does have some benefit to it. It's just not a huge bang for the buck. The advantage is really inexpensive compared to some of these other medications. So patients who are cost is the main issue, we say, look, if you want to try this and your insulin is off or they want more energy, yeah, we'll try it with them. It's not my favorite. It's again, it's low-hanging fruit. You can get it at the pharmacy for five dollars. And people who want to try something, and again, usually have another issue, either again, insulin or weight gain or females with like a lot of uh, hormone issues, it does help. So it's usually an, an add-on. Um, I mean, the big three or four that we use in terms of prescriptions are, I mentioned before, rapamycin, which is the main thing is it's an mTOR inhibitor, um, reduces autophagy, but again, it's now been shown to affect, help the immune system at low doses, at high doses, it's a cancer medication, which is an immunosuppressant, and doctors are, who aren't for, as familiar with the anti-aging way of doing it are like, no, no, I don't want you on rapamycin, especially your immune system, but we know the low, lower hang, lower doses don't do that. Um, and then it's also been now, it's been, I mean, there's high, it's, it's being used now potentially as um, for brain health, both as protective as well as treatment, um, as well as now for, for big one of people really interested is they're using now here in New York for study on fertility for females. Um, and it has shown some pretty, it helps with egg quality and other things. So there's a lot of things in terms of all those different benefits. Um, when it's been tested, it, it has some of the highest numbers in terms of getting as many anti-aging markers that are out there. It helps with stem cell production. It helps with the immune system. It helps with autophagy. It helps get rid of um, potential oxidative stress and so on. But, but, but different factors. It, it's going to be not incredibly expensive. It's something you don't have to take once a week. The dosing, depending on who you talk to, is still kind of negotiable. Um, I tell don't be somebody who's going online and taking great fruit juice with it to augment that because you're right. probably just going to end up with mouth ulcers and nausea. Um, I mean, again, it's one of those things where more is not better. The, right now, for most people, the lower doses work well. We check that with the things like biological age tests and CRP and other things. Um, but we're getting closer and closer to the point where it's getting more and more fine tuned of how to take it. Um, and it's great because it's a pill. It's not something you're doing IV. Easy, somewhat easy to get. The cost is not through the roof. That by far is number one. Acrobos, which is a di another diabetic medication. There is a correlation. We know that diabetic medications, all of them that are out there, I mean, they're bouncing your sugar levels or working on insulin. They're calming down inflammation. The newer meds are also working on some of the brain health and they also work on the microbiome. 
So they're targeting just coincidentally aging markers to begin with, and they're treating sugar levels we know causes all these other issues. So there's a definite coincidence, not, not a coincidence there. Um, yeah. Acrobus is the di di another diabetic medication. It's been shown to potentially increase lifespan in men, not women, which is a lot of the things you have to see the studies um, that a lot of the anti-aging prescriptions are work in men, but don't do anything in females. We don't know why exactly. Um, so we're waiting for some more data to come on that. Um, the one side effects is it can cause upset stomach and bloating, um, but it does work really well. Um, the other prescription, there's two other prescriptions that are in the really infancy stage that we're using for people who really want to push it. One is Ozempic and Monjero. People know about them now for weight loss. But again, the data, because what they do in terms of for the diabetics is anti-aging in itself. Um, and now they're seeing that it helps um, help brain inflammation and again the microbiome and so on. So we're, we're quote unquote micro dosing patients with it, not using the weight loss dosing, but much slower dose than a different, a much longer interval in between. And we're seeing patients notice a lot of improvement there. Um, but that's we're trying to overcome some of the negative stigma of the medication because there's people who think they're the greatest things to sliced bread. Other people think they're the devil. So it's it's a very interesting conversation to have with people. Some people are on board and love it. Other people are like, I'm never putting that medicine in my body, which you don't get anything else that's out there right now. But I think once more and more data comes out, I think people will be more on board with it because it has a lot of potential. It's just a question of do you want how many, most people who see me will inject themselves. So it's not really a concern. And one that may kind of top all of them besides rapamycin are the SGLT2 agonists, which are diabetic medications. Again, they work on the kidney. And preliminary, we're seeing the same benefits that with all the other ones in terms of brain health, in terms of decreasing inflammation, in terms of their people who are on their, their aging tests are dramatically improved. So those are kind of the major ones that are out there. I mean, people use lithium for low dose lithium, which is anti-psychotic or anti psychiatric meds, has some improved health, anti-aging benefits. I mean, there's other ones that we kind of are out there, like growth hormone, which has a small niche for some people. Um, we're learning how to dose it. We're going lower and lower with the dosing, and it does have health benefits, um, if, but it's baby doses. Um, those are really the prescriptions that we're using. Um, this culture scene, actually, I mean, again, this culture scene, there's a couple other ones out there, but those are the big ones. What's your opinion? We covered a lot, so that's thank you for all of those. This is awesome. But this is this is fun stuff. Uh, we're just going through this list because these are these are all the questions that we get all the time, and I, and you've been so succinct and and um, explaining the pros and cons of them. Any other areas like uh, NAD treatments and things like that? that have you, what's um, your opinion? NAD is kind of. There's no, there's not a lot of data behind IVs, but people feel anecdotally feel better with them. Mm -hmm. And then there's one study on mood and that's about it, but people feel great on them. So it's kind of a, I, it's not my first choice anymore. I mean, again, it was again, in the beginning when it became popular, there were one of the few games in town and now there's a lot of other things that we use. Um, there is, I think um, orally or the sub Q injections, which are injections in the belly, I think have benefit. We know that NAD affects fertility. We know NAD kind of definitely affects mood. I think it's useful. It's just a question. There's so much noise out there about which way you should be doing it. Should be doing my, my patient before I spoke with you or asking about patches or do I do this? We just don't know. The new product, NAD product coming out that has a little bit different mechanism that may be just as good. Some people say NMN is better. I mean, for me, if you're doing pill NR, it probably has a little more data behind it at this point. NMN is trying to catch up. So the answer is, it's something I recommend to my patients, but I have, um, it's not my first tier, it's probably second tier. And, but if somebody really, but there's, and but unfortunately there's not huge data behind any of it right now. That's the I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, top biohacks, like uh, technology that you feel has the most bang for your buck in these areas. Um, I mean, I mean, I I think number one for me is sauna. It's simple and it, it does a lot of health benefits. And it's I mean, anybody can, almost anybody can do it. Um, Hot, dry, infrared. I am both. I mean, I mix and match. I mean, I think infrared has its benefits. Just sometimes we get hot enough. 
So I'll go into like, a, I'll go like to a Russian bathhouse and do really hot sauna as well. And I also do a mixed hermetic therapy where I'm doing the hot sauna for 20 minutes. I'll go on the cold plunge for two or three minutes and then I'll go back and forth to really optimize it. Yep. Um, again, so that's that's one. Um, other biohacks that I really like, I mean, hyperbaric is, has just huge pluses to it. Um, I think we're getting, if the, we get this brain training right, I think there's a lot of devices out there that are really, really close. I mean, I don't think that's a home run yet. There's a new product that just came out I'm trying now that's probably been the best so far. Is that one? Uh, Sensei? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know all those guys that developed that. Oh, I've got one. We're really I'm gonzo in the brain develop the brain. I mean, I mean, if you can get trans a good transcranial stimulation unit and you're somebody who's good with it, it's probably even bigger bang for the buck. But most patients aren't that adept to do it at home. They need to go to a place that's going to do it with them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the customization around brain training, I think, is really misunderstood. And you need a uh, an expert in that field, not j just to just to figure out what's going to be your optimal brain. So, like Matt's brain, my business partner, mine. We we have we run totally different brain states, and all the people that I've experienced around that have noticed yeah, massive sure. variance in what's their primary brainwave or their neurophysiology or what they want to do and then how you're going to use your cultivate your training around it yeah, those are my i mean those are the big ones that i really really like now i mean I, I like red light um again i love i've started to delve into more of the cranial red light um again we're still waiting again waiting for perfect data um but i i really i find a benefit with it those are probably again those are probably the technologies i really really use more frequently than anything else at this point personally yeah, the, this is uh, fantastic. So, um, so I'm going to let the la the last piece, particularly, I want you to focus on yourself as a physician. So, and I, and I, I want this as both a, a caveat and an invitation. And what I mean by that is, it's very easy for people to get excited, read a book, see a post do a podcast, listen to whatever and say, oh, I got to do this. They run off to wherever and start randomly shotgunning that. Um, someone who wants to live their best life. Can you explain to them what the process that they need to seek out and why they need a doctor such as yourself in order to quarterback the virtual like I don't know, uh, you know, the plethora of possible things a person could do because this is like it's extensive. You have some people out there just spending like, you know, you have the Brian Johnsons of the world that's spending two million dollars a year just really trying to push the longevity thing with all kinds of experiments. And then you have the average person says, hey, I want to feel better, look better and be better uh, and avoid some of the negative side effects of my uh, aging process. And they need a doctor again because you need to figure out what the, again, I use cheesy analogy, what the biggest elephant in the room is, number one, and then find out where you should be starting and what's going to work the best for you in the short term and then also develop a long-term plan. It, it's both. You need to do both. It's not just, again, you fix the big problems first, you get some things on the maintenance side started first, and then you go from there. There's very few people out there who have the expertise and knowledge of, to know how to do that. Um, and then you need somebody to tell you, okay, this is the stuff that works. This is stuff that's all social media driven. There's no data behind it. I mean, it's, and you also need the medical understanding. If you have, unfortunately, the precursors to a neurodegenerative issue or you have major gut issues, you need to, you can't just treat that on your own. In most cases, you know, people think they can. A lot of cases, you need somebody who's going to work with you and develop a prescription for you. And that's the other piece about this, like how frequently if you're working uh, with a doctor and we advocate at Bioptimizers that you get, we always call it your Jedi council. Uh, you have your Jedi council, the, you know, you don't, Jedi council doesn't make moves unless you have your, uh, your Jedi masters that are going to help you on that. What's the relative frequency that someone should be working with a professional such as yourself in regards to like health and longevity, these type of things? It depends. It depends. Most patients probably every two to three months. Yep. Um, I see patients. Um, 
But again, it depends on what their goals are. I have patients I see once a year. Um, a lot of them, it's usually to really be good at this, it's usually every two, two to three months to really to fine tune and change things. Otherwise, if you wait a year or even six months, you're going to back where you started from. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. The, the human mind can only handle about 90 days tops and it just can't stick on to things. Exactly. That's why big corporations have quarterly reports. <laughs> exactly. You need to know where you are. Uh, that's great. Um, any final thoughts or words um, before we kind of turn it over to you to kind of tell where, where they can reach you, how they can find you? I know you do practice telemedicine. That means you're available in a whole bunch of different places if people want to do your cons as a consultant. No, no, no. Two things would be A, know what your goals are. Don't be afraid to tell the person you're working with what your goals are, what you do want to do, what you don't want to do. Because once I, you know the person you work with knows what your parameters are, you're going to get where you want to get to. You don't need to have any static in that regard. And number two, like I've said a couple of times, more is not always better. Sometimes it works great. Sometimes it can be an utter mess. So you need to understand that. You need to, again, it comes back to where you want to potentially work with somebody because you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, for your money, for your effort, for your time, for your family, and so on. That's great. Well, where can people find out more, contact you, hire you, follow you? All that sort of stuff. The, the easiest way is to go to the website, which is doctor spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R Paulden.com. Um, and I also have the other two places are YouTube and Instagram, where I have put a lot of different content out um, where people can learn everything from basic things to some a lot of deep dive stuff as well when we do some lives and some longer YouTube stuff. So all the a lot of the things that we talked about today are there in different in different entities. Okay, folks, so we're going to pop that all on the uh, show notes of this podcast. If you like it, please share it or give us your comments or questions. And I would encourage you, uh, if you're taking the next step on your biological optimization journey, to ensure that you have a professional who can help interpret through the noise and the hype with what's right for you. And Dr. Paulvin has done an extraordinary job of really cutting through a lot of crap in a very short period of time. That was, that was a tremendous amount of data and information. I hope our listeners loved it. For all you out there, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Wei T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers. This is another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. We'll see you on the next episode. And of course, uh, put, smash that like button and share with someone you love. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you. And now for a Bioptimizers fixed digestion tip, turn cultured foods into superfoods. Raw fermented foods like sauerkraut and low sugar live yogurt can be good for you, but rarely have enough of the right probiotic strains for therapeutic benefit. So here's a way that you can turn them into superfoods. What I do is I get some raw sauerkraut or a healthy yogurt. Ideally, you know, it's grass fed or coconut based, and you can empty three caps of P3OM into a container and mix it up thoroughly. Leave it at room temperature for a couple of hours before putting it back into the fridge. And what's going to happen is these probiotic levels will be multiplied. In fact, it doubles every 20 minutes. And then what you're going to get is you're going to have a food with strong proteolytic activity. To learn more about P3OM and why its patented strains make it the strongest probiotic available, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizer's Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.